Repeat after me. There is no shame in wanting to make money from something you have created. Hello and welcome to Aratatex, the follow-up series to the Seven Deadly Trading Card Game Sins where we look at interesting aspects of game design. So recently I highlighted a couple of games that were launching their crowdfunding efforts, Gem Blenders and Monster Crown. Full disclosure, I had direct involvement with the Monster Crown Kickstarter. Either way, both of these games managed to hit their respective funding goals, but each one had a different kind of adventure in order to actually get there, and that gives us a chance to have a learning experience. Gem Blenders, for example, met its funding goal in a single day and had the luxury of focusing on outreach and stretch goals, while Monster Crown... <laughs> but be that as it may, the fans have spoken and the ball is now in their court to deliver. So let's take a step back and see what goes into a successful Kickstarter campaign. By the way, yes, I know I'm going to be using the word Kickstarter a lot sort of interchangeably with crowdfunding campaign, but seeing as Kickstarter is the Kleenex of Gatorade, I am probably just going to be doing that out of habit, so sorry. I know there's other alternatives out there like Indiegogo and stuff like that, but it's just going to be a difficult habit to break. Crowdfunding is a fascinating thing. It's a way for people to get the funding they need for their creations and projects without being held accountable to large publishers or corporate interests. Just the people who are incentivized by the promise of getting a copy of the product for themselves and the thrill of being a part of something. We live in an age where most new games that aren't made by or for massive companies tend to turn to crowdfunding websites like Kickstarter to fund their first print run. This gets them the money they need to finish polishing the work, develop supporting material, and place their print shop order so they can have a product to show off and sell. A successful Kickstarter can open a lot of doors, as it can be used as proof of demand for game stores, distributors, and publishing partners, so it pays to do it right. Now when it comes to actually calculating the total you should be going for on your Kickstarter, you should account for everything. The cost of doing a decently sized print run, usually at least 500 to 2500 pieces being the normal minimum, shipping the print run from the factory to your location, along with any storage rental if the order is big enough, mailing supplies, promotional costs, crowdfunding fees, artist and writing fees that are currently unfinished, and I'd say roughly 10% contingency should anything fluctuate in between the time you make the Kickstarter and the time you start paying money. Now, for the cost of actually shipping these items to the backers' homes, there are lots of services out there like BackerKit that have the backers themselves paying into this shipping cost to take care of automatically. And for the love of Pete, do not set your goal lower than what you actually need in order to try to entice people to buy. That is going to bite you way harder than it will help you. Now, before you launch your Kickstarter, what do you need the most? Finely tuned visual presentation? That's certainly nice. A slick video and sizzle reel? Yeah, those are swell too. A monetary goal based on all those things I listed earlier? Well, that's the basics. But none of those are as important as the number one most important thing you need before you launch your Kickstarter. An audience. Okay, I know this sounds like I'm putting the cart before the horse. I mean, aren't we launching on Kickstarter in order to let our game get noticed? No! If you're launching your Kickstarter with a starting audience of your mom, you're doing it wrong. Kickstarter is not for getting noticed. Kickstarter is for getting paid. And speaking of getting paid, let's introduce today's sponsor, Alpha Clash by Rising Empire Studios. Alpha Clash is the new superhero-themed card game with a slick comic book art style that's managed to rake in over $400,000 on its Kickstarter campaign. Pay attention, kids. This isn't just an ad. It's educational content. The Earth has been changed forever. Strange energies have caused the emergence of super-powered humans known as Alphas. In this game, you can take on the role of one of these Alphas, the hunters who resist them, or even one of the progenitors that caused this all to happen in the first place. Represent yourself with contender cards, special cards that gain more abilities as the game goes on. Do battle by playing clash cards, which represent powerful allies or exude the contender's own force of presence. Fight in many locations based on our real Earth. Wave plans, set traps, and unleash your ultimate power with action cards. The game is based on an entire universe of unique characters, appearing across many cards to demonstrate their personalities and stories, such as the sinister Magnate, the young hero Sonoro, and of course, who can forget the Avenging Guy? He's the Avenging Guy, Avenging Guy, the Avenging Guy. 
Alpha Clash will be available to purchase in both card game and graphic novel form on July 21st. You can learn more about Alpha Clash at alphaclashtcg.com. You've heard the stories, right? Projects posting on their banners how they were funded in a day, funded in two hours, funded in five minutes. This wasn't because of some miracle effect of people constantly refreshing Kickstarter because they have money to burn. No, this was because these projects already had a ton of people lined up and waiting for that drop date. Like with a lot of project releases, pretty much every successful card game Kickstarter has at least several months of pre-production and hype building. It's why you always see way more projects in preview than active, even though these projects are usually run for well over a month. So yes, while you should spend the time leading up to your Kickstarter by having a decent supply of polished assets to show off, some physical cards for B-Real or mail-outs, a well-designed page with loads of visual aids and slick aesthetic design, keeping some of those slick aesthetic designs for emails, you should be reaching out to people to draw attention to your game. This involves setting up social media, starting a Discord, and looking for places where game enthusiasts mingle. There really are places where people go to find new experiences and you can show them what you've got and invite them along for the ride. Just don't be too pushy. This is actually advice from Kickstarter directly. Just ask this guy. Initially, my plan was to launch Kickstarter without telling anyone about Elestrals and just kind of surprise everybody with this project I had been working on, but I actually spoke to Kickstarter about that, and they advised me that it would be best to kind of get people involved beforehand, so that way, when the Kickstarter actually rolled around, people were excited about it, we can kind of have a good starting point. Invite that audience to be a part of the creative process, showing them updates and art drafts, or building a game demo on Tabletop Simulator. Heck, in the year leading up to their Kickstarter launch, Gem Blenders used Patreon for some residual earnings to send out test prints to their followers. Elastral's got as high as it did entirely because of its pre-existing audience, thanks to the creator already being a popular YouTuber. Remember how I told you to set aside some visual assets to make some emails? Those can be used to make letterheads to send to people in influential places who can give you some advice, ping their fans, or even promote the game for you, though sometimes that can require a bit of an advertising budget. Now, you could also go to conventions by getting a booth or hitching a ride with somebody else to promote your game, but success on this is kind of limited depending on your presentation, and honestly, things like convention presentations I'm probably going to cover in a different video. Developing an organic base tends to be cheaper, but it also takes much longer. A little bit of hype can go a long way, as long as hype's not the only thing you have. Now, I know the way I'm talking about this, I can come across as somebody saying, Hey, yo, gotta make that green, bro. But again, there is no shame in wanting to make money from something you've created. As long as your goal isn't to be a big scam that leaves a bunch of people holding the bag. But one of the best things about building your audience is that it doesn't really matter as much which crowdfunding website you use, because your audience will want to go buy your game regardless of where you post it. Granted, again, Kickstarter is the Gatorade to Indiegogo's Powerade, so there are some marginal benefits to going green, but it's not quite the advantage you'd think. And I know this can be kind of scary, you're going from a creative who's probably done a lot of work on your own to going out there and doing social media and appealing to people, although if you've been focusing on building a team, you might be able to have somebody else do all of that. It's, it's a process to starting a business, which frankly, launching a Kickstarter is what you are doing. You get it though, all of the game development in the world doesn't mean a hill of beans if you have nobody to sell it to. Building your audience should be part of the process of getting your game together and assembling the other things needed for your Kickstarter page. So what are the things you need for your Kickstarter page? Well, ideally you will have a sizzle reel, attractive infographics, a playable version of your game, a rule book with polished visuals, either quick play or complete, a gameplay tutorial, suitable tiers, realistic stretch goals, and a future roadmap. Let's tackle these one by one. Hi there, my name is Kodak and you've already clicked off of this video because it's just my flapping head on a flat background as I stare directly into the camera and straight into your soul. Yeah, this is probably the biggest mistake I see on these sorts of projects. Like, you're required to include a video on your Kickstarter pages, but so many people when they set these things up just film themselves speaking into a camera for a little bit and 
act like that's the proper thing they need instead of a proper sizzle reel. I mean, they don't even have like a, a nice microphone or anything like that. And I'm gonna tell you, you want a sizzle reel. A sizzle reel is the video equivalent of an elevator pitch, something brief, attractive, and informative. Its short length should be matched by a high degree of polish. This can involve the use of visual effects, basic animation, slick camera work and editing, and importantly, a focus on product. I mean, sure, it can be fun to talk about your creative process and things like that, but people are here to buy a game, not a documentary. Development logs and things like that make for nice bonus material, but not for your main video. For that, you definitely want a sizzle reel. Other approaches are a whimsical opening, or serious lore with character line reads and basic animations, like the 10 bajillion knockoffs of Hearthstone's opening. The Knights of Noble Mare will defend this land the way we always have. Always have. We the Beastmen have put aside our differences to claim our rightful place on the stage of history! I mean, this is actually not as hard as you might think. Just make sure that during the art creation process, you have the artists render the character layers separate from the background layer, then you can hand it off to someone who knows basic Blender who can rig the illustration up to move it around like a puppet. Not that hard, actually. Those guys can also rig up models of imaginary product, too. Boxes are like the easiest thing to make in Blender, and there's a booster pack asset that costs like five bucks. Still, remember, people are here to buy a game and you need to show it to them. Fake some quick gameplay, show off the cards, gather some friends to act hype on a big play on camera. A lot of the things I mentioned in my tutorial video on tutorials can help here. And a lot of the things that you make for that sizzle reel can also be used for... So one thing I think you'll notice with a lot of Kickstarter projects is that they rarely fill the text boxes with actual text. Text is boring, it's coarse and it gets everywhere, and it tends to form a wall between yourself and the customer. Instead, the campaign is alive with pictures, fun fonts, testimonials, and prefab designs. If you're familiar with the concept of a pitch bible, a document used to pitch an idea to a, a publisher or investor, then that methodology works here as well. Big pictures with bite-sized text. Assets made for these can also be used for promotional images, box art, that email I told you to make earlier, or rule books. Let's have a look at how our Kickstarters fare here. Gem Blenders has a pretty good sizzle reel considering their budget. A brief animation where some dancing kids transform into superheroes before immediately moving on to the game, its basic play, and its hook. This is a very slick presentation, though I do feel the dancing at the start goes on a little too long. Monster Crowns is a bit stranger. It's the game's creator dancing with the broom. It's odd, but at least it ends with an actual monster showing up. That certainly catches some attention, but maybe not the strongest sizzle. As for layout, Gem Blenders has gone full infographic, letting them control image and text positioning, as well as giving a coherent texture throughout. A lot of nice assets with easy bite-sized text. Monster Crown instead incorporates images into the text lines, but again, they have a consistent look, informative visuals, and not a lot of text between their pretty pictures. Though on launch, a couple of things were missing. The Monster Crown campaign launched without a game tutorial, an up-to-date rulebook, gameplay footage, or even a polished tabletop simulator demo. I mean, they hadn't even secured their Twitter handle, and I mean, come on. So let's see what happened when these pages launch. Gem Blenders had spent a lot of time polishing their visual aesthetic while building a fan base through appearances and outreach over the course of the couple of years. They hit their goal in a single day. Monster Crown, on the other hand, while they did have an audience thanks to the video game that this whole card game was based on, didn't even have their Kickstarter page fully complete on launch and hadn't done much outreach at all. They got less than a third. Okay, so I do feel the need to stress this. Since you should be trying to build as large an audience as possible before your project goes live, to the point that actually launching the Kickstarter is more of a formality than anything, your day one numbers actually matter a whole lot. If you do not make considerable progress towards your goal on day one, you are in serious trouble. Day one is when the vast majority of those interested will chip in and that momentum will collapse almost immediately. 
No, Dick Gumshoe, getting $100 of your $10,000 goal on day one is not a good start. Success attracts success, and if you don't nail it day one, you're gonna have an uphill battle. So put simply, gem blenders could live large, using their success as a way to draw in more people who might want to invest in a finished project. Meanwhile, Monster Crown really had to step up their game. Either way, a hands-on approach is necessary, and those are done with physical product and virtual mock-ups. A physical copy of your game is probably the biggest confidence builder for a brand. Footage of you thumbing through cards, games being played, a nice big box full of printed material, it shows that you have a finished thing ready to go and not just some pipe dream. The best source for these physical cards is via a print-on-demand service. Print-on-demand services are not going to be a good option for your final print run, their lack of overhead balanced out by their lack of profit, but they are fantastic for running off mock-ups, sample products, prototypes, things to show off, things to toss to interested influencers, things to give away. Another good thing to have ready in advance is a polished virtual demo, such as the ones that can be made on Tabletop Simulator or Screentop.gg. These can let people try out the game under the supervision of the designers and give people a chance to watch a game in action. Tabletop Simulator is much better known and offers more options for customizing in items, but it has a paywall to do anything other than spectate. I'm still learning about Screentop.gg, but it is a free service that can be run on a browser and seems limited to cards only. Print and plays are also a common tactic here, and I have added a few of them to my gaming archive. But unless it's a trusted player or a longtime playtester, don't give your players all the toys to play with. Keep them hungry, make them want to buy into that first release to get all of the toys to play with. Of course, for a high enough backer tier, you could unlock a demo that has more of the cards or more of the toys to it, but if it's not something you can directly supervise, I'd stick to just, like, some demo decks and a few basic cards. From here, you can use things like OBS or Twitch to play games on stream that anyone can watch. A cheap digital camera on a C-stand can let you host live games with real cards and let people really experience the depth the game is capable of, while allowing some additional playtesting and discovery of degenerate cards or combos. Needless to say, Monster Crown was in trouble. This was about the time I was brought in to help whip things into shape. But a lot of the effort was pure outreach on behalf of the other folks, making more content for social media, and running games pretty much every night via Tabletop Simulator and Discord, adding in new cards as their artwork was finished, talking to people influential in the keeping people's attentions. It certainly helped draw attention to the Kickstarter, but of course, the question is asked, once somebody has been drawn to your Kickstarter page, what do they do once they get there? Probably the most defining thing about crowdfunding websites are their reward tiers. Based on how much you contribute to a project, you get something in return. Now, with a lot of projects, this can be a tricky thing to set up. You either get the product, or you don't. Maybe you'll get a deluxe product, or a signed copy, or your name in the credits, or even more copies, or a statue. For standalone games, this is where things often end. You usually get the thing, or you don't. But, trading card games are modular, and this modularity serves itself well to creating different tier levels. Similar to the products you can buy in stores, it is pretty much effortless to make different tiers for trading card games, since they are already a medium that lets you choose your level of participation. I've seen everything from single boosters to an entire store's worth of product, but I notice a lot of them boil down to these few tiers. The Dabbler tier, the Interested tier, the Committed tier, and the Premium tier. Dabbler tiers are usually things like a deck or two, maybe some booster packs, the simple basics that barely give people enough to play. By far the cheapest, for those who are like mildly interested but don't or can't commit too much to it. The Interested tier is often a bit more complex, usually being the Dabbler tier with the addition of a high-end item like a booster box. A pair of decks and a booster box are how a lot of modern-day hobbyists will get into a new game these days, and I've found this is often the most popular choice among backers on these sorts of Kickstarters. Committed tiers are for people who are super excited for your game and really want to leap in. Does your game have more than two decks? They get all of them. Booster box? They get more. This is sort of a complete package level, maybe with some additional bonuses to upsell people who might be on the fence. After this, it might be tempting to go harder, have something that contains even more than the committed tier, even more boxes, even more decks, but... 
thing is, that kind of pledge is kind of obsolete in the face of add-ons, where people can add a little bit more money in order to get a few additional rewards here and there from what they want. So people will generally use add-ons to get their fix, and larger tiers from the committed tier are a bit of a waste, frankly. No, tiers above committed should be reserved for those who want to leave their mark on a game a premium tier whose special benefits include limited merchandise or, more prominently, a chance to be immortalized in the game itself. These are the be a hero, create a card, join the artwork levels a lot of games show off, but they can be sort of hard to balance. Going back to our two games again, Gem Blenders, for all of its success, did not sell a single one of theirs as they were priced way too high at $10,000 a piece. Monster Crown, on the other hand, despite only making a third of the way to their goal on their first day, actually sold all of theirs right away because they were priced too low at just $500 each. I guarantee more than $500 worth of labor is going to go into each of those custom cards. Generally, these sorts of tiers are leveraged against how much that exclusivity is valued versus how much someone can reasonably expect it to put down. Somewhere in four figures makes sense to me. Actually, that's not a bad thing to pivot to. How much should you be charging for the things on your pledge list? Again, the goal of a Kickstarter is to make a large and efficiently priced print order, along with paying the costs of the crowdfunding fees, the shipping, and other basing expenses. I mean, Kickstarter requires you to report on these things anyway, so it's a good thing to keep track of. Thing is, as long as you source things properly at a high enough production level to get these things inexpensively, you can still make a tidy profit even if your tiers are lower than your standard MSRP. Since you are essentially doing direct sales this way without the costs of distributors or stores to cut into that, even a modest discount can net serious profits. This is, of course, assuming your game is pretty typical as far as designs go with things factories already set up to do, and you're not gunning for anything extravagant. And again, there is no shame in wanting to make money from something you created. Though, of course, a simple discount isn't the only tool you have at your disposal. You also have things like stretch goals and special Kickstarter branding and limited edition items. Things that, you know, might be working a bit of FOMO, but frankly, these guys are helping you fund your dreams and bring them to reality. They deserve a bit of recognition. As long as it's not something that's like totally impossible to get after the Kickstarter is over, like you don't want to be locking unique cards behind it, but things with like special art and markings are generally okay. Now, of course, there has been this thing running around where certain Kickstarters say that they will add in a bonus booster box to every single backer if they manage to get a high enough threshold. And funny thing about that, if your order is large enough, the amount that you save by increasing your bulk order and thus lowering the cost per unit might actually be able to pay for itself. It's actually not as ridiculous a stretch goal as you might think on the surface. Another popular thing is early bird specials, letting those who get in early save a bit of money on their pledge or get some other kind of bonus. A couple of things though, don't time gate these. Quantity gating is enough. If somebody jumps onto your Kickstarter and sees that they missed out on the chance to get the thing for cheaper because of a time limit rather than the early bird tier selling out, it'll make them leave. So checking in on our Kickstarters from before and Gem Blender seems to have gotten a little relaxed, slowly bleeding contributors like a pinched balloon might be a good time to get some Twitch going even though they are still well above their goal. Monster Crown on the other hand is still in trouble. Granted, their tabletop sim, how to play, and other social media work is out and helping, but at this rate, they need to add $1,000 a day to make it to their goal. But a shrewd play enabling international buying by adjusting their backer kit opened the way for people outside of the United States to buy in, which got a lot of progress. But then something happened. False pledges. I'm going to avoid the tighter details, but the Monster Crown project fell victim to a boulder I'm just going to call Jan Janssen. This guy basically came out of nowhere and pledged 33,000 US dollars, more than the original goal all on its own. Thing is, this was not the first time Jan Janssen had made his presence felt in the game space. So, when it comes to pledges and calculations, Kickstarter is actually okay with accepting a promise that you are going to pay. They take your name and their credit card information, but they don't actually take the money 
until the project is successful and completed. This has created a unique form of griefing, however, where people put up big pledges that they say they're going to pay out and either yank their pledge at the last minute or never had the money there to begin with, and so the whole thing kind of lapses. It's actually one of Indiegogo's big selling points in that they actually take the money right away when you make your pledge, so you can't pull these kinds of shenanigans. And in the world of card game Kickstarters, few people are more infamous than Jan Janssen. Just a note, this is not their actual name or their pseudonym. I'm keeping them ambiguous for privacy's sake. Do not look for this person. The thing about Jan Janssen is that they tend to show up to a campaign and make pledges of 10 grand or more, often multiple times, inflating a Kickstarter to well beyond its goal and then some. But then the money they promise never manifests. And Monster Crown wasn't the only place Jan Janssen had struck. Other games were affected as well. Ellis Strolls was out almost half a million to this guy. From what I can tell, Jan Janssen's motives are unclear, whether they are toying with the emotions of creators or think that as long as the needle moves past the goal, then everybody gets what they want. I cannot say for certain, but neither belief is helpful. Thing is, these sorts of pledges are still counted by Kickstarter to check whether or not a project succeeds or fails, but also how much of a fee they will take. So false pledges like this will leave a project high and dry with tons of responsibilities and none of the money needed to fulfill them. So just don't do that. Thankfully, I and the rest of the team were immediately suspicious. A statement was put out and Kickstarter was contacted about the problem. Jan Janssen's pledges were pulled and a one-week extension was added in because of the conundrum. And they would need it, as with all of those lost pledges, they were still 5,000 behind their goal, with only a couple of days remaining in their initial campaign. Thankfully, the Jan Janssen incident did draw out supporters who managed to get it back above its goal before the extension even started. Gem Blenders had slipped, but still ended their campaign at over $50,000 with an 11th hour rally, more than doubling their original goal and hitting the threshold for a few stretch goals. But of course, that's not the end. Funny thing about crowdfunding, it's not over when the clock runs out, it's just the beginning. It's called Kickstarter, not Kick Ender. Indie Go Go, not Indie Stop Stop. A successful campaign does not mean your McNuggets are over. Oh, I wrote struggles, but I read it as McNuggets. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm tired. It's it's four in the morning, and I'm I'm having a day. First, a word for those who fall short. Depending on how short you wind up falling, there are a number of lessons to take. Often the biggest problem is a lack of outreach combined with too high of a bar to clear. That, or just plain overestimating yourself. Sometimes it really can be that. Falling short on a Kickstarter is not the end of the world, however. If it looks like you're going to wind up well short of your goal and there's maybe one or two days left remaining, you're okay with pulling the plug. Put out a statement saying that you observed all the factors and made the tough decision. This helps you keep from looking so skittish that you dropped right away, but not so foolhardy that you clung on to the end. Take it as a step. Do efforts to keep the people you have drawn in and use that to reflect and figure out how to fix these problems. But for those who succeeded, well, the work has just begun. First thing you might want to do is check your Kickstarter's health. I know this sounds like an odd thing to ask. I mean, you succeeded, right? What does it matter how you got there? Well, it's simple. Your Kickstarter is also a reflection of the audience you have cultivated, and the way your Kickstarter succeeds can be as important as succeeding at all. Like I've said in other videos, a successful Kickstarter can be used as proof of interest for game stores and distributors, especially for something as open-ended as a card game. So making sure your game has popularity is important. Now, when I refer to a Kickstarter's health, I mean how much your average backer is putting into it, not just your total. Which tiers are picked most often? What is the median? Let's take a look at Gem Blenders. Gem Blenders got roughly $50,000 from roughly 250 backers. A pretty easy calculation to make. Divvied up, this gives us an average buy-in of $200. Kind of impressive considering nobody took the top tier, and median-wise, it drops us just here, right between the interested and committed tiers. Not bad, maybe a little high, but most people are buying in at levels not uncommon for people jumping into a game. 
Monster Crown has, I'd argue, an even better average of $123.25. This is like two decks in a booster box on any other game. It is very much an investment made by somebody more interested in playing a game than on buying boxes to sit on. If, on the other hand, your Kickstarter made $25,000 with, oh, 67 backers, eyebrows will raise. That is not a healthy Kickstarter and will likely get you a yeah sure kid from the sorts of stores you're going to talk to. The reason I stress this is because the people who run stores and distribution are running businesses and are looking for something called product churn. This is the ability for a game to go from shelf to profit in a regular flow. Now this does revolve around business in a way that I think, again, merits its own video, but pointing out that backers bought in at the level people looking to try out a game will buy in is much more a point in your favor than how much money you made. You'll need a strategy in place, things like organized play, product support, and player retention, and I've made videos about a couple of these already. But once the money arrives, you gotta ship. Ideally, you had your print shop picked out and had a quote to print and ship long before you launched your Kickstarter, and using all the precautions I've talked about in other videos, such as pre-jumbling your cards for the printing press. Of course, the turnaround might eat into that contingency I talked about before, which is why I said to make one. Services like Backerkit can help with shipping charges, but you're still stuffing those envelopes yourself, so be ready for that. It's gonna take space, and it's gonna take time. And of course, the best part in all of this, starting work on set number two. You had your entire lifetime to make set number one, and only a few months to make the follow-up. Have fun! And that's the skinny on crowdfunding. Thanks again to Gem Blenders, Monster Crowns, Elastrals, and our sponsor Alpha Clash for helping me pull this whole thing together. We live in a time where practically anybody can jumpstart their game with help from others, and proper consideration towards appeal, longevity, and participation will serve as the key to help your game move on to the next step. Now for you, a fantastic next step would be to check out my Patreon, where just $1 a month can get you access to my Discord, where I've been hosting game nights and more. A big thanks to my $10 and up backers. And yeah, a lot of the general stuff, don't go and pick on anybody who I might have used in this video as an example. This is a channel for learning, not for hurting. And speaking of learning, I have a whole treasure trove of videos you can check out about the worlds of trading card game design, and I'd love it if you funded my crowdfunded effort, that being liking and subscribing. And that that actually costs you nothing. I really hope to take this channel to some amazing places and only you can help me with that. So yeah, that's the quick skinny on crowdfunding. We will have to see how the games I've backed have done in the future. I'm definitely going to unbox a little bit of Alpha Clash and uh, keep these things in mind and you too can build a better card game. Join us next time on Erratatext.